The reasons to set up a colony in America were varied. One was because of a competition with Spain. Having forts in the New World would help with a future war with Spain, which was becoming more likely. Another was to spread the Protestant religion across God's earth to all his people. There was also the opportunity of gold, silver, and other resources. A quote from the 17th century play Eastward Ho shows this. Talking about America, it says, Gold is more plentiful there than copper is with us. All their dripping pans and chamber pots are pure gold. Of course this wasn't true, but it was all part of the bait that lured people over to the New World. Trading for spices was also a large motivator in finding a new passage to the Far East. The trading routes across continental Eurasia were very dangerous to use. There were many small principalities along the way that would charge a toll to pass through their territory. Traders were often found robbed and murdered. Innkeeps and anyone else providing a service would charge outrageous prices. Taking a sea route was much preferred by the turn of the 17th century. The Roanoke colony was started by Sir Walter Raleigh. He was an English noble who was one of Queen Elizabeth I's courtiers, a spy and nobleman. He was given a charter to colonise North America. If he was not successful within seven years, this charter would be removed and given to someone else. All of these colonists were employed by the Virginia Company and were paid a salary. They weren't indentured servants, promised land, which would be the way of the permanent Jamestown colony. The idea was to stay and work for a couple of years and then return home to be replaced by new employees. An initial expedition to the area was made by Philip Bamadas and Arthur Barlow to explore the eastern coast of North America. They established relations with the local natives, the Secretan and Croatoan tribes. They brought back two Croatoans named Mantio and Wanchis, who told them of which tribes lived in the area and what they could expect. Plans were drawn to launch a colony on Roanoke Island, which they had scouted out prior. Raleigh's fleet was commanded by Richard Grenville. Born in Cornwall and elected both MP and Sheriff there, he was an esteemed and highly respected captain, privateer, coloniser and explorer. Governor of the colony was to be Ralph Lane, the soldier who had fought in Ireland, who was second in command of Grenville's troops. The fleet comprised of a flagship called Tiger, a galleon-esque ship, another ship the same size called Roebuck, accompanied with three smaller brigantines and two pinnaces. They set sail for America, but ran into a storm near Portugal and got separated. The flagship Tiger had to cross the Atlantic Ocean by herself. After a month of sailing, they hit the coast of Puerto Rico at a location where they had agreed to meet up, if anything like this happened. Ralph Lane ordered the soldiers to construct fortifications in case of a Spanish attack. While there, they managed to seize two small Spanish frigates, which had all the varieties of treasure on board. Grenville continued up on the coast of Florida, and on June the 23rd, the Tiger went aground and beached. Fortunately, she could be refloated. While this was underway, Grenville led an expedition exploring the river networks and the surrounding area. They found an Indian village named Aquascog. While visiting, the Indians had stolen a silver cup that they had brought. Enraged by this, Grenville gave the order to the expedition leader, Philip Armados, to go back with eleven soldiers and demand the cup back. When the Indians could not provide the cup, Philip burnt their cornfields, their houses, and all the people of the village fled. Unfortunately, due to what is a relatively petty incident, this event ended the previously peaceful relations between the English settlers and the native tribes. Meanwhile, on the coast, some of the other ships from the fleet had met up back up with the Tiger. Grenville set sail back to England with his Spanish prizes and the remainder of his fleet, leaving the colonists there to settle Roanoke. Throughout the winter and spring of 1585-86, to Governor and Explorer Ralph Lane scoured the hinterlands to find out what the great land of America had to offer. They had with them Indian interpreter Mantio, Wanchis, the other Indian who had accompanied them back to England, had returned to his tribe, distraught with the English way of life. On a voyage through the Albemarle Sound, Lane and about 40 armoured men encountered Chowanok village. Lane and his men arrested the chief, Menatonon, using Mantio, his interpreter. He collected information from the old chief about the tribes further inland. Wingina, a friendly chieftain that lived on Roanoke Island, moved his tribe to Damanoskopek village. This could have occurred for a multitude of reasons, but Governor Lane took this as an affront. On June the 1st, paranoid that Wingina was planning an attack on the colony, Lane entered the village to investigate. Once he was inside, he gave the watchword, Christ our victory, which once heard his men started slaughtering the inhabitants of the village, one of them Wingina himself. Such a preemptive strike was not exactly uncommon for the era. The native Indian tribes also participated in similar violent raids upon each other. 
At the end of 1585, King Philip of Spain seized all English ships in Spanish ports in retaliation for Queen Elizabeth's support of the Protestant Dutch and piracy against Spanish shipping in the New World. An unfortunate event for the Roanoke colony as this disrupted the ship destined to resupply them. Fortunately for the colonists, however, recently knighted Sir Francis Drake, perhaps the most famous pirate of all time, was on his way. Drake had for a long time wanted to invade New Spain at its Panama choke point. Elizabeth, however, had always said no, too afraid of the Spanish Armada might take the English Channel and mount an invasion on England itself. However, after the recent seizures of English ships, all bets were off and Elizabeth gave the green light for Drake to launch a raid on New Spain. Along with 2,300 soldiers and sailors, Drake set sail for the Caribbean. Drake raided and burned many outposts and forts along the American coast. His men were getting sick, however, and many died. In the end, he decided too many were lost to mount a raid on Panama, so he headed north out of the Caribbean, back home. On the way back, Drake decided to attack the Fort St. Augustine, stealing from the Spanish. Thirteen or fourteen great pieces of brass ordnance and a chest unbroken up, having in it the value of some £2,000 sterling by estimation of the King's treasure. Before burning the wooden fort and all its houses, Drake made sure to salvage windows and other hardware that could be useful to the colonists at Roanoke. Drake had amassed 1,200 passengers in his fleet that were freed from the Spanish, including Englishmen, Frenchmen, Flemings, Moorish and Turkish slaves, Indians and around 250 black slaves. There was a problem, however, as Drake did not have enough supplies to take them all back to England. He wanted to leave the 250 blacks and the small boats he had at Roanoke. Drake met with Governor Lane and discussed the situation. Drake informed him of the coming war with Spain, and Lane explained that they were short on food and could not house 250 slaves who outnumbered them two to one. Eventually, after much discussion between the two men, the decision was made to abandon the colony and cross back to England. The decision was not taken lightly, and unfortunate for the three men out on expedition in the interior who were left behind. Grenville returned to Roanoke on another expedition. There was no mention of the three men left behind, but two hanging corpses were found. One white and one an Indian. There is little information other than that, and it is one of the smaller mysteries of the Roanoke colony. Grenville sent out search parties and looked for two weeks, but found no sign of late survivors. He had the command of 300 troops, but decided to leave only 20 men behind to guard the fort, perhaps because Grenville was unaware of the now incredibly hostile relations with the native Indians. One day, two Indians showed up at the fort, and two soldiers went forward to meet them. Before anyone could react, one soldier was killed, and 40 Indians appeared out of nowhere, and the other soldier ran off, alerting the others. They barricaded the supply house, but the Indians set it in light. The soldiers retreated out of the fort, and one man was shot and killed by an arrow. The rest escaped to the boats and rowed away, never to be seen of or heard of again. With everyone gone or back in England, you might think Sir Walter Raleigh would be disheartened and give up on the idea of settling Roanoke, but you would be mistaken. Raleigh sent out three more ships and 117 people, including women and children, commanded by gentleman artist John White, upon arriving very shortly afterwards. Ananias Dare gave birth to Virginia Dare, the first English baby born in the New World. Each man came of his own accord and was awarded 500 acres of land by Raleigh. However, there was a catch, as the area was inhabited by natives that would have to be removed first, before the area would be able to make use of the land. In hindsight, this deal isn't as good as those who took it thought it was. While searching for crabs one day, a colonist was killed by Indians. John White led an expedition south to the island of Croatoan to negotiate with the Indians there. Talks broke down, however, and they went back home, and nothing was gained. The colonists talked with each other and discussed about their dire situation, and they convinced John White to set sail back to England and ask for help in late 1587. While he was back in England, though, a war broke out with Spain, and every ship was needed to fight the Spanish Armada, and White was unable to return to Roanoke for three years, until 1590. He managed to get a passage on a privateering mission, organised by Raleigh, and another man named John Watts. White returned to Roanoke, but found the fort was empty. The only sign as to where the colonists had gone was a carving into a fence post saying, Croatoan, potentially referring to the island, the tribe with the same name. Expeditions were launched to look for the colonists, but they were never found. There are various theories as to what happened to them, one being that they moved and were wiped out by an Indian tribe. Another theory is that they moved on and integrated into an Indian tribe, and simply never reconnected with the further English settlement to come. Thank you for watching, and subscribe if you want more.